The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. All right, uh, today we have lecture, guest lecture two of two by Kostas Daskalakis. All right, uh, glad to be back. <laughs> so let's continue on the path we followed last time. Um, let me remind you what we did last time, first of all. So I talked about uh, interesting theorems in topology, Nash, uh, Sperner, and Brouwer. And I, uh, you know, defined the corresponding, so these were the theorems in topology, I defined the corresponding problems. Uh, and uh, because of this existence theorems, the corresponding search problems were total. And then I looked into the problems in NP that are total, and um, I tried to identify what, what in these problems make them total, uh, and tried to identify a combinatorial argument that guarantees the existence of solutions in these problems. Motivated by that argument, which turned out to be a parity argument on directed graphs, I defined the class PPD and I introduced the problem arithmetic circuit set uh, from which, uh, which, which is PPD complete and uh, fr fr you know fr from which I promised to show a bunch of PPD hardness reductions this time. So let me remind you the you know salient points uh, from this uh, list before I keep going. So first of all, the PPD class has a combinatorial flavor. In the definition of the class, what I'm doing is I'm defining a graph uh, on all possible n-bit strings, so an exponentially large set, uh, by providing two circuits, P and N. P is a circuit of possible uh, father and uh, n is the circuit of possible child. And uh, given these two circuits, I establish a directed edge between string v1 and string v2 if they agree on their parenthood relationship, meaning v2 believes v1 is its father, and uh, also v1 believes v2 is its child. In, in that case, if this condition is true, I establish an edge between these two pair of nodes. And I do the same for all pairs of strings. And in the end, I get a graph. And the problem end of the line is given these two circuits and the corresponding graph that they define on this set, if the all zero string is unbalanced, uh, meaning different in and out degree, then uh, I want you to find another unbalanced uh, node string, okay. uh, which is guaranteed to exist by the parity argument. And PPD is the class of all search problems in F and P that are reducible, polynomial time reducible to this problem. Uh, remind you, I'll remind you also of the structure of the graph defined by these two circuits. It's easy to verify that uh, uh, if my edge definition is this, then every vertex has in degree and out degree at most one. So uh, the graph that's induced by these two circuits will have this form. And basically, I'm looking for all red points. I mean, for any of these points, any of these red point strings are solutions, any unbalanced string, except for the all zero string. Mm -hmm. If the all zero string is not unbalanced, then I don't want you to do anything. If it is unbalanced, then I'm looking for any of these red <coughs> vertices. So that's the class PPD, and it has a combinatorial flavor. Okay, So I'm defining a huge graph via these two circuits, and I'm asking you to find any of these red points. Okay, So uh, on the other hand, sort of like the, the problems we were targeting, Nash equilibrium and Brouwer's theorem were, you know, had a more continuous flavor. So uh, instead of uh, uh, working directly with this problem, with end of the line, and trying to reduce the, uh, this problem to Nash and to Brouwer to establish PPD hardness reductions, I actually introduced a problem that's, actually that's closer to this problem, which is it has a continuous flavor. And it was the problem arithmetic circuit set. Uh, there were a bunch of problems last time uh, about uh, the definition of the problem, so I decided to uh, be more explicit about what it is. So 
basically I'm giving you a circuit that has two types of nodes, variable nodes, V1 through Vn, and gate nodes, Z1 through Gm. Now, every gate node has one of uh, six possible flavors. Okay, it can be an assignment, no assignment gate, uh, an addition gate, a subtraction gate, set equal to a constant gate, multiply by a constant gate, and comparison gate. Um, depending on the type, it's going to have uh, from zero to three inputs, to two inputs, and it always has one output. Now, what I wanted to emphasize is that this uh, graph doesn't have inputs, input v uh, variables. Okay, it loops are allowed. And uh, what I want to emphasize, which I didn't emphasize last time, is that variable nodes have in degree 1. Uh, and gates have 0, 1, or 2 inputs, depending on their type. Otherwise, uh, you know, for instance, the out degree of a node could be uh, arbitrary. The uh, fun out could be arbitrary, it doesn't matter. Okay, but you have to respect this. Every, no, every variable node has in degree 1. Uh, every gate node has 0, 1, or 2 inputs, depending on the type. Uh, there are no edges between uh, gates and gates and variables and variables. There are only edges between variables and gates and gates to variables. Okay, that's the input. The input is a circuit that has this form. And what I want you to do is I want you to find an assignment of real 0, 1 values to the variables of the circuit such that the, co the, the, the constraints of the gates are satisfied. A and here are the constraints of the gates. Okay, so if the gate is an assignment gate, I want that the output node, the node who's connected to the output of that gate, uh, has equal value to the node that's feeding into that gate. If the gate is an addition gate, I want that the variable node who's uh, the output of the connected to the output of the gate to be basically the sum of the values of the inputs to the addition gate, except I'm also going to threshold it. Uh, I'm not going to allow it going above one and so on and so forth. So these are the gate conditions. Okay, so now uh, what I said last time is that a satisfying assignment always exists for this problem. It's not a priori obvious, so it requires work. It actually is, it is going through a fixed point to argue that there is a, always a solution to this problem. Uh, what I also claimed last time is that uh, it's PPD complete to find a satisfying assignment. So it's a natural starting point for reductions. What I also said last time is that, in fact, I can allow some noise in the error, in the uh, gate constraints. So I can allow plus minus epsilon uh, deviation from the gate constraints. Uh, and, uh, okay, so this should be a minus epsilon, sorry about that. Uh, and this epsilon is part of the input. Okay, so I can, I can, I can uh, sort of like, I can give us input, both a circuit and an epsilon, and I will ask you to satisfy the gate constraints with an epsilon. Now, last time I also showed you the structure of the hardness proof for Nash, which basically took the generic PPD end of the line problem, generic PPD complete problem, end of the line, it embedded it into geometry, into uh, the 3D cube, then it uh, defined a version of Sperner's lemma, which then it reduced to arithmetic circuit set. And I didn't show this part of the reduction, and I'm not going to show it, because that's the complicated part. But what I, I'm going to show is how to go from this problem, the arithmetic circuit set, to Nash equilibrium. Okay, just to show how easy it is to uh, work with this problem and reduce to other problems. Uh, okay, so that's what I want to focus on. So, okay, so that was the, that's the review from last time, and this time I want to talk about, I want to show the PPD completeness of Nash equilibrium. I'm going to briefly uh, give two other examples that uh, have um, that, 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 that come from combinatorics, and then uh, lastly, I'm going to talk about other existence arguments and the complexity classes that they define. Uh, so I'm going to introduce these classes: PPA, PPP, and PLS. Uh, before I do that, also that was a question from last time. PPD stands for polynomial parity argument in directed graphs. Okay, 
corresponding to the fact that this class is defined with this uh, parity argument on directed graphs in mind. Okay, cool. So let's focus on this reduction from circuit to Nash. I want to introduce a, uh, a concept before I show the reduction. Uh, that concept is graphical games and uh, polymetrics games, a special case of graphical games. So graphical games were introduced in 2001 by Kearns, Littmann and Singh. It's something very natural. Uh, uh, basically, they tried to capture situations where the payoff of a player only depends on the actions of uh, a few other players because of you know, geographical communication or other constraints. So in a graphical game, uh, the players are nodes in a graph, in a directed graph. And uh, a player's payoff only depends on her own strategy as well as the strategies of the players that point to him. Okay? Uh, for example, this guy's payoff depends on this guy's, this guy's, and this guy's action because all of these guys point to him as well as his own action. Uh, a special case of these games was actually uh, introduced much earlier. Um, so polymetric games are graphical games where the payoff functions of the nodes are actually edgewise separable. So for instance, the payoff of this guy uh, as a function of everybody's mixed strategy is just separable over all edges that point to him of some pairwise payoff function that has to do with this action and his neighbor's action. Okay, that's what's written here. And it's not very hard to see that any um, uh, so this is a utility function that depends on uh, uh, the two mixed strategies, right? And, you know, by assumption, these players randomized independently of each other. So any such expectation of a, a pair of player strategies uh, that are a product can actually be written as a quadratic form. Right, do you see that? So if, um, um, let me write it on a board. So again, so, uh, so XU is the, uh, XV uh, is the mixed strategy of player V. XW is the mixed strategy of W. What I mean by U, W, V, x u comma x v x w is basically an expectation over an action s u drawn from x u and action s s w sorry s v drawn from x v s w drawn from x w independently of And that's uh, just the sum, right, overall as u's and overall as w's of, uh, uh, you know, u, w, v, s, v, s, w, and then the probabilities. And that's a quadratic form, if I, uh, right? So that's what I mean by this line. Right? Because players play independently from each other, any uh, expectation with respect to that product distribution is a quadratic form. I'm not saying something interesting. Okay, good? Okay. So uh, then a polymetric game is really, because of this, is defined by a directed graph. And then for every directed edge, uh, and every uh, uh, there is a matrix uh, that defines the quadratic form for that edge. Okay, so a polymetric game is, is easily described. It's, uh, you can you can describe it by specifying the graph and then giving a matrix for every directed edge. So Bay matrix game is two are two player games. So that's why these are called polymetrics because you have many matrices. Okay. 
In a two-player game, you only need to give two matrices. One for uh, a two-player game is uh, just uh, player one, player two, and you give one matrix for this direction and one matrix for that direction. So that's a bimetrics game. This is a polymetrics game. Okay. Okay. Good. Uh, now, what I want to do is I want to uh, before, sort of, in order to reduce arithmetic circuits out to Nash, instead, what I'm going to do first is I'm going to reduce arithmetic circuit uh, SAT to finding a Nash equilibrium in a polymetrics game. That's what I want to do first. After I do that, then I wanna, I'm going to reduce it to. So here I have many players. I want to go down to two players. But the first step is to just go to many multiplayer Nash equilibrium. Then that reduction is the easy part. Actually, also, also this is an easy part. Uh, the hard part happened before. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, okay, so now how do we? How can we reduce uh, an arithme arithmetic circuit set problem into a polymetric game Nash equilibrium problem? Like in NP completeness, uh, uh, for, uh, like uh, you know, in reductions for NP NP hardness proofs. You have to uh, give gadgets, right? You have to identify objects uh, in polymetric games that simulate uh, the operations that happen in your circuit over here. So what I want to introduce, I want to introduce what is called the game gadget. These are small polymetric games that do various arithmetic operations, which I can then put together to simulate an arithmetic circuit set problem. Okay. So what I want to do is I'm going to give you, you know, a flavor of this gadget. So I'm going to give you the addition gadget. So I want to give you a polymetric game that does addition. So it's going to have, this game is going to have four players. Every player will have just two strategies, zero and one, two pure strategies. Hence, the mixed strategy of that player is going to be a real number in 0, 1, which corresponds to the probability by which this player plays 1. Okay? Um, so here's the structure of the gadget. Okay, so this gadget, I'm showing it here, embedded into a potentially bigger polymetric game. But uh, uh, the gadget itself is going to have four players, X, Y, W, and Z. Now, X, Y are what's called the input to the gadget. So these are players who point to W, but don't depend on the actions of W and Z, because there are no directions going the other way. So these guys are, don't care about what these players are doing, right? and they serve as an input to the gadget. Now this player W uh, gets as input all you know, player strategies in this gadget, while Z only cares about what W is doing. Okay. So X and Y are going to be called the input players to the gadget. Z is going to be the is going to be called the output player to the gadget, and W is going to be called the auxiliary player. Now, what I want to do is I want to define. So, uh, what I, the only thing I'm going to define is the payoff function of W and the payoff function of Z, and I'm going to define these payoff functions in a way that addition somehow happens at a Nash equilibrium of this little game. Um, so I'm going to define the payoff succinctly, but then I'm going to convince you that these really correspond to tables. So I'm going to say that W is paid an expected, uh, depending on what he plays. So if he plays 0, he gets paid an expected probability x equals $1 plus probability x equals y equals $1. Uh, if he plays zero, but if, if he plays one, he, he only gets paid probability z equals one dollars. Okay, so in some sense, if he plays zero, he looks to the left. If he plays one, he looks to the right. His payoffs are uh, the sum of these two guys' probabilities of playing one, in one case, and one, uh, and this, prob this guy's probability of playing one in the other case. So that's, that's the payoff function to w. Now, you would ask me, you know, maybe, uh, you know, how can you implement these payoff functions? Uh, and uh, that, that's actually very easy. So here is the table for player W. So when W plays 1, plays 0, I'm going to, his payoff, depending on the strategies of X 
and y, I'm going to define it to be 0, 1, 1, and 2. Now notice that in expectation over these, over x's and y strategies, his payoff, his, so if he plays 0, his expected payoff over x and y strategies is just uh, the probability that x plays 1 plus the probability that uh, y plays 1. Do you see this from this matrix? And so what's the expected payoff to w when he plays 0? Well, this is 1 if uh, y plays 1, but uh, x plays 0. And it's 1 if uh, x plays 1, but uh, y plays 0. And it's 2 if they both play 1. And I claim that if you appropriately correct, collect the terms, this is just equal to probability y plays 1 and x plays 1. Okay? So that's, that's what I claim. Okay so, uh, okay, so I covered this line. This line is also easy to cover by saying that when w plays 0, his path just depends on what uh, c is doing. And it's going to be like this. Oops. So when W plays 1, his expected payoff is exactly the probability Z plays 1. Right, so what I've written here is actually consistent with some tables that I'm hiding from this slide. Uh, okay, so that's, I guess that's what I, what, what I want to write. And then similarly, z is paid to play the opposite of w. What do I mean by that? I mean that z's payoff, when he plays 0, is exactly 1 half, no matter what w does. But if he plays 1, his payoff is 1 minus uh, w plays 1. Which again, you, you, you should be able to see that there is a table, a little table implementing these payoff functions. Okay, now that sounds weird. Why did I define it this way? Here's my claim. In any Nash equilibrium of a game that contains this little gadget, the probability that the output player plays one is basically the sum of the probabilities that the input players play one. Threshold it at one, of course. Okay, so if this little gadget that I find here is part of a bigger game, now, what does the bigger game? What can the bigger game do? So it can fit. It can fit something into x, and it can take the value of z and use it in some other way, potentially looping around, doing anything it wants. Except, you know, the only inputs to w's payoff are x, y, and z, and the only inputs to z's payoff is w. But otherwise, the game can be arbitrary. Okay. So if this game that I defined here is embedded within a bigger game then in any Nash equilibrium of that bigger game, the probability that this guy plays 1 is exactly the sum of the probabilities that these two guys play 1, threshold it at 1. Now how can we see this? Why is that true? It's a little uh, case analysis. It's very simple. Let's try to do it. Uh, let's say that... Uh, so suppose that probability that z plays 1 is smaller than the probability x plays 1 plus probability y plays 1. Actually, let's do something else. Uh, <laughs> it's smaller than the, let's see, the min between this and 1. What happens in this case? So what, if, so what happens if z is smaller than the minimum of these two values? What is w going to do in that case? Yeah. Is he going to play 0? Yeah, because 0 gives him a much higher payoff. Uh, it gives him higher payoff than this guy, right? But because of that condition. No? So this implies that uh, w is going to play 0 with probability 1. 
Now what does this imply? If w plays 0 with probability 1, what does z do? If he plays 0, he gets 0.5. What if he plays 1? How much does he get? He gets 1, right? Because of that condition. So he's going to play what? 1. Right? So this implies that uh, but how can 1 be smaller than the minimum of 1 and something else? It's, it can't be, right? So this is impossible. Is that so let's do the other side. Or maybe you already trust me that it's OK. Uh, let's try to argue that this cannot be the case. I don't need to do the mean anymore, because uh, it can't possibly be that this guy plays more than one probability. So. This is the only case I want to consider now. Okay. So what happens in this case? The same logic. Uh, what does W do? Play one. It has to play one, because that's the be better strategy. And what does he do? It's zero. But zero can't be bigger than two, uh, the sum of two other probabilities. So this and that can't happen. Hence, uh, the only case that's possible is uh, this one. Yeah? OK. So it's very simple. Okay, so the only realization one had to do is that, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, so like where the arithmetic happens, right? And it happens in the mixed strategies chosen by the players. That's where the arithmetic happens. So then, uh, OK, so this is the addition gadget. Similarly, one can define other gadgets. For example, the subtraction gadget is really, really similar to this, except with one change. I replace this plus with a minus. OK, that's the only change I need to do. In other words, uh, I'm not sure I want to do it, but in other words, uh, uh, this table. For for I only change this table to have um, zero here and minus one here, and I'm exactly implementing that the subtraction. And the, the 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 proof is exactly the same. You can argue that in any Nash equilibrium of a game that contains this gadget, the probability that this guy plays one is actually the difference of the probabilities that x plays one and y plays one. Uh, appropriately truncated at zero. Any questions about what's taking place here? What we're trying to do is we're going to want to take a s arithmetic s circuit set instance, and we want to create a polymetric game that simulates that circuit set instance. And what we need for that is gadgets, so little uh, polymetric games that implement various operations. Uh, and I showed you addition and subtraction, but uh, I claim uh, that you can implement a bunch of other gates. So to, uh, you know, sort of like uh, give my notation, to have a more succinct notation, I'm going to use probability that some node plays 1. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to differentiate with an x and the probability that x plays 1. Okay, so with this notation, I claim that we can implement all the gadgets that we need to simulate a circuit SAR instance. OK, so let's look at this table. So in all these lines of this table, Z is the output player of the gadget. X and Y are the input players of the gadget. And potentially, the gadgets implementing each of these gates use auxiliary players. Like uh, in the addition case, I was using one intermediate player. He was the auxiliary player. And uh, the claim is that um, you, know, you can implement gadgets such that if any of these gadgets I is contained in a bigger polymetric game, then at any Nash equilibrium of this bigger polymetric game, the these conditions are satisfied uh, by the uh, output and input players of the gadget. 
Okay, and this is as long as you don't mess up with the gadgets, meaning that uh, the bigger game ha can have edges into the input players of the gadgets and edges out of the output players of the gadget. But I claim that you can implement all of the gadgets that you need. So in particular, if you have an instance for arithmetic circuit set, you can create a polymatrix game by composing gadgets uh, for each of these gates so that uh, at any Nash equilibrium of this polymatrix game all uh, gate conditions are satisfied. So in particular uh, you are uh, by, by finding a Nash equilibrium of this game you are solving the instance of, ar of uh, uh, arithmetic circuit set you started with. So that's the idea. Any questions about uh, what, what, what happened? so far in the lecture. Questions about this reduction or, or how the gadgets work? Yeah. Does this give a valid proof that um, every instance of arithmetic circuit set has a satisfying assignment? Yeah, that's, co that's correct. Oh, okay. uh, because uh, this is a game, so by Nash's theorem there is a Nash equilibrium. Hence, uh, uh, there is a solution to that because uh, Nash equilibrium is a solution to that. That's exactly right. So actually, that's how we get it. Um, one thing that's not exactly obvious, but you can argue that it's true, is that actually not only there is always a solution, but there is a solution in rational numbers uh, with polynomial description complexity in the input size. So that requires some linear programming um, techniques, but uh, that's also easy to show. So, uh, you know, a priori, bra uh, Nash's theorem will give you that a solution exists. It wouldn't give guarantees about uh, the description complexity of that solution, but using linear programming, you can argue that there is always a rational solution with polynomial description complexity. Are you interested in seeing any of these gadgets? But, you know, I've only showed addition. Do you want to see anything else? Or? You believe me that I can actually do that. The comparison one that has arbitrary output yeah. under certain conditions yeah. seems interesting. Okay, I can show that. Uh, so let me try to do the comparison gadgets. They're actually simpler than the addition gadget. Uh, so, yeah, so I want to implement a comparison. So I'm going to have the input players and the output player. And the payoff of the and the payoffs of the output player are let's see right. So if you play zero, then his payoff is uh, only depends on x, and it looks like this. If he plays uh, one, let's see, let's see if it works. I haven't I haven't prepared it, but it's easy to construct. I guess <laughs> worst case I'll backtrack. Uh, okay, so now what I want to argue is that uh, uh, let's bring up the conditions that I need to satisfy. Okay, so I want to satisfy those conditions. So let's see if I do satisfy these conditions. Okay, so I messed it up a little bit, I guess. So I have to replace x here and y here. Okay, now let's see if that's true. So I claim that if probability x is bigger than probability y, then what, I, what, I, what do I prefer to play? I prefer to play z, right? Similarly for the other case, when they're equal, anything is possible. So that's that's simple. There's no, no, not much trickery going on here. Okay. Cool. So I've established that uh, this direction of the this this part of the reduction. Now I want to go down from a polymatrix game to a two-player game. That's the next part of the lecture. So how do you go down to two players? Well, the first thing to note is that uh, uh, all the 
gates can be implemented with bipartite graphs. Okay, so if you remember my addition gadget, uh, if you remember my addition gadget, it had uh, the input and the output players on one side and the auxiliary player on uh, one side. My comparison gadget does not satisfy this property because the input players and the output players are on different sides. But I claim that you can implement actually comparison by adding a next, uh, an, an additional step with a bipartite graph. So I claim that all gates can be implemented with polymetric schemes that have input and output players on one side and auxiliary vertices uh, on, on, one, on the other side. Okay, so I claim that um, all my gadgets are actually bipartite. So in particular, I can color this graph with two colors, blue and red. And what I want to do is I want to uh, uh, create these uh, super players. I'm going to call them lawyers. I'm going to have a, I'm going to have a red lawyer and a blue lawyer. Okay. And the red player is going to represent all the nodes that are colored red in here. Well, the blue lawyer is going to uh, represent all blue nodes. Right? Um, and what I want to do is I want to define the lawyer game in the next slide. OK, so every lawyer, so the red lawyer, his strategy set is the union, not the product, the union of the, that's important. Otherwise, my reduction would be exponentially large. The, my reduction wouldn't be polynomial. So. Every lawyer, and that poses actually technicalities in the construction that I'm about to present, but uh, every lawyer will have, as a strategy set, pure strategy set, the union of the pure strategy sets of the clients that he represents. So the red lawyer has one strategy for every strategy of every red node. The blue lawyer has one strategy for every strategy of every blue node. Okay. Now, what I want to do is I want to define the payoffs in the lower game. What are the payoffs in the lower game? Well, what happens if the red lawyer decides to play strategy I of red client U? And what if at the, the, the blue lawyer plays strategy J of blue node V? What are the payoffs of the two lawyers in that choice of strategies? Well, it's going to be exactly the corresponding payoffs of the nodes of the polymatrix game. If so, the red lawyer will get will get the payoff that you would have gotten in the polymatrix game if the if the two these two players play, played I and J, and uh, the blue lawyer is going to get uh, his client's value, so V's value, under the same the same choice of strategies. So in particular, if there's no edge between these two nodes that blue and red lawyers chose to play, uh, the nobody gets anything. That's the, the, the payoff here is going to be zero. Um, you know, if there is a directed edge from uh, V to U, then this is going to be zero, and that's not going to, you know, that's uh, whatever it is, and vice versa. But uh, you get the idea. If if the blue lawyer decides to represent a client and the red lawyer decides to represent uh, another client, then the payoffs of the lawyers are the corresponding payoffs that the clients would have gotten had they played the strategies that the lawyers decided to play for them. That's the definition of the lawyer game. Is it clear? Now, the wishful thinking is <laughs> that if x and y is a Nash equilibrium of the lawyer game, then if I look at the marginal probability distributions uh, on the different nodes, on the different clients by their lawyer, then these marginal probability distributions are a Nash equilibrium. Okay, so the wishful thinking is that if I start with a Nash equilibrium of the lawyer game, then if I look at uh, the distribution that uh, the red lawyer, the marginal probability distribution that the red lawyer places on every red node separately, 
and the marginal probability distributions that the blue lawyer places on all blue nodes separately. So all this collection of marginal probability distributions, that this collection is a Nash equilibrium of the poly matrix game. That's the wishful thinking. Okay. Uh, questions about what the wishful thinking is. Okay. Okay, of course, this, that's wishful thinking because we know how lawyers behave. <laughs> they only represent the lucrative clients, right? And the, uh, you know, a priori, there's no reason that the red lawyer would have incentive to uh, choose at least some strategy for, uh, you know, to place positive probability mass on every node he represents. Maybe in a Nash equilibrium of this lawyer game, uh, some of these marginal distributions are actually undefined because the lawyers are, are ill-defined because the lawyers place zero probability mass on the strategies of those nodes. Okay, so that wishful thinking isn't going through, but there is some truth to that, so there is a way to fix it. So here's how we're going to fix the lawyer game. So we're gonna, we know what lawyers like, they like money, okay? So we're going to define a high-stakes game that the lawyers are going to play on the side at the same time as the actual game that we're interested in. Okay? So for a lot of cash, okay, so these are the stakes of that game, uh, we're going to do the following. So uh, some uh, terminology first. So suppose that without loss of generality, suppose that every lawyer has n clients he represents. Okay? So uh, and let's label the, the red lawyer's clients 1 through n and the blue lawyer's clients 1 through n. If, you know, one of the two lawyers have fewer clients, then we can pad this with, you know, dummy players and that doesn't change the polymetric game's equilibria. Um, so, suppose that both lawyers represent the same number of players, uh, clients, and let's label both lawyers' clients 1 through n in an arbitrary way. Okay. Now, uh, the high stakes and, and the strategies of the high stakes game are exactly the same as the strategies of the game that I showed in the previous slide. In particular, the red lawyer has the union of the strategies of all blue nodes, the red and the, and the red lawyer has the union of the strategies of the red nodes. Now, what's the high stakes game? Uh, suppose that the red lawyer plays any strategy of client J and the blue lawyer plays any strategies of client K, then if they choose, the they choose different clients, they both get zero dollars. But if they get choose the same client, th I mean, it's not the same client, it's the same label of a client, right? Because they each represent different clients, right? But if they choose different labels, then they both get zero. If they choose the same label, uh, the whoever it was, the red lawyer gets a lot of cash and the blue lawyer loses a lot of cash. Okay. okay, again, so this game has the same strategies as the uh, lawyer game that I showed in the previous slide. Except now in this game, all the lawyers care about is the labels of the of the uh, clients whose strategies they choose. So if the uh, choose a strategy of a client that has the same label, then the red lawyer gains a lot of money and the blue lawyer loses a lot of money. But if they choose strategies of clients with different labels, then they both get zero. Uh, in other words, in some sense, the blue lawyer is trying to avoid the uh, red lawyer and the red lawyer is trying to catch the blue lawyer, okay, if you want. So now, this is a simple zero-sum game and it's not hard to see, to see that uh, in any Nash equilibrium of this game, uh, so the unique Nash, I mean, in any Nash equilibrium of this game, the lawyers is gonna, are gonna represent every client with the same probability. So, uh, each lawyer assigns probability exactly 1 over n to the set of his strategies corresponding to each of his clients. So the high-stakes game ha has the property that 
the lawyers represent all their clients with the same probability distribution and you can divide that probability distribution in an arbitrary way within the strategies of each of their clients in this game. That's easy to see. Just by the symmetry of the game, this has to be true, right? And with these two definitions, the game, the really the game that I'm going to do for my reduction from polymetrics games to two-player games, is going to be the, the, the sum of these two games. Okay, so this is the game that I defined earlier, right? And this, is a, this matrix is a block matrix. So this is a block of strategies corresponding to Th this matrix is a matrix that has uh, is a constant matrix where everything is big and uh, this block corresponds to these are the strategies of client with label one for the red lawyer and this is the the strategies of the uh, client of the blue lawyer with label one and so on and so forth so this is a block matrix and there are m's and minus m's in these diagonal blocks and everything else is zero. So that's the high stakes game. It's played among blocks of uh, strategies because all I care is the label of the client I'm choosing uh, for each of these lawyers. Well, this is a more fine grained game where uh, I not only care about which clients I'm choosing but also which strategies of these clients I'm choosing. And I'm going to choose an M that overwhelms uh, the payoffs in this game. So this condition is okay for what I'm about to say, but think of M as huge compared to the maximum utility in this game times the number of, of clients in that game. Yeah? Just to make sure I'm understanding this so far. So in the naive game, if the two if the red guy chooses a strategy and the blue guy chooses a strategy and the two vertices they choose from are not connected by an edge, then they just both get zero. Yeah. Okay. And if they're connected, they get the payoffs that the corresponding nodes would have gotten with so these two strategies. The directional edge, one of the one on the outgoing vertex will still get zero. Exactly, yeah. Uh, cool. Any other questions about, yeah? Uh, even with a really large choice of M, can't it still like mess up the values a little bit? So yeah, it will mis mess it up a little bit. Yeah. So the Nash equilibrium of this game, the addition of these two games, is not going to have the property that this game by itself had, but it's going to be very close and I'm going to be specific about it. But the choice of M is so that the, DB, the fudging isn't that big? Uh, even for arbitrary large M, I can't actually ki quite show that uh, the lawyers represent their clients exactly equally, but they come really close, and the larger M is, the closer they come. So in particular, I can show the following statement, that uh, in any Nash equilibrium of the combined game, uh, if X use the total mass that uh, the, blue, the red lawyer places on the sum of stra on that on the union of strategies of uh, node u then that's about 1 over m but there is some error that decays with m and similarly for the blue lawyer okay, so approximately they're representing all their clients and if i choose m huge then at least my marginals are well defined now right so the, there is probability mass on every client and I can define these marginal distributions. Now, whether these distributions are useful or not, we're about to see. Okay? But what I'm saying here is that as far as deciding how to split the pie into my clients, really the large game is what matters, the high stakes game is what matters. Because if I make a mistake, um, you know, M is huge, so I'm hugely punished. So for splitting, for decide, how to split my total unit of, ma of probability mass into my clients, only the high stakes games, ma essentially only the high stakes games matter. On, th uh, on the other hand, uh, when it comes to, you know, having decided how, how much mass to put on the union of a particular node strategies, deciding, you know, about the fine-grained, you know, the fine-grained decision of how to allocate that, uh, uh, X, U into the different strategies of that node U, 
then actually only the small gain matters. And the reason is that the payoff difference of the red, let's say, red lawyer uh, uh, from strategies U, I, and U, J, so uh, to distinguish between strategies I and J of node U, f the payoff difference between th these two choices doesn't have M in it. If you, if you actually look at it, M goes away. There's no M in the pair of difference between these two options. So which one is better doesn't have M in it, okay? Um, essentially, it doesn't have M in it. There is some M in here, I mean, because this, uh, you know, I'm summing over all nodes, and different nodes uh, have different uh, sum of uh, probabilities, but I'm going to get to that, okay? But so trust me that uh, when the red lawyer is trying to decide how to allocate uh, uh, this XU probability that he has decided to allocate on uh, the different strategies of node U, he looks at this difference, that's the difference in the two payoffs, and essentially there's no M in this equation. So we're going to see wh where M gets into the picture and why. But this is just from the definition of the game. I claim this is exactly true. The difference of the two payoffs is exactly this. Now, from that equation it follows that if they learn decides to put positive probability mass on a particular strategy i of that node, then this, for all j's, for all alternative strategies of that node that he could choose, it better be that this pair of difference is positive. And that is really, really looks like the condition of the, the Nash equilibrium condition for the client, if you think about it, because if I define, you know, the marginal probabilities of node U on these two strategies, on, the, on these strategies, then this is really the Nash equilibrium, then, you know, the Nash equilibrium condition for that node U. And the, only, the only problem is to go from this equation for the unmarginalized probabilities, V, uh, Y, V, L, to the marginals, I'm dividing with something, and that something isn't equal for all these. So, if it was equal, then these marginals would actually be directly in Nash equilibrium. Because this condition, I could just divide by, you know, 1 over n, and this would be made a marginal probability, and that's exactly the equilibrium condition for client U. The problem is that uh, these xv's are not all equal, why, why v's are not are equal, so I cannot just divide by 1 over n and claim that the equation is still true, but because, but the point is that this uh, error doesn't create too much problems in the equilibrium conditions, and okay, it's not going to be an exact Nash equilibrium for the polymetrics game, but it's going to be an approximate one. And um, because I can take m to be as large as I want, I can make this approximation go to zero as, m as fast as I want. And, you know, remember, this arithmetic circuit side problem allowed some error in it. So what effectively is going to happen here is that, okay, so I'm going to get an approximate equilibrium of the polymetrics game, so that would correspond to an approximate equilibrium of the arithmetic side problem I started with, but this approximation can be accommodated and the problem is still PPAD hard. So that's approximately how the argument works. So this, uh, you know, uh, the fact that the distributions aren't uniform doesn't really matter as long as M is chosen large enough. I went a bit too fast, so I want to... I, I didn't mean this to be sort of like uh, very detailed, but I meant to convey the, you know, bigger picture. And the bigger picture basically says that you can analyze what happens in this lower game in two steps. In one step, you argue that the lawyers approximately represent all their clients. In the other step, you have to decide how these lawyers allocate uh, their uh, pr probabilities to the different strategies of a particular node. 
So that leads you to write down this difference of payoffs that the lawyer is experiencing uh, when he switches. Uh, the, the, you know, th this is tracking how much better the expected payoff from this strategy is compared to that strategy. And by the equilibrium conditions of the lawyer game, you get the inequality I showed in the next slide uh, that if the lawyer decides to place positive probability mass to a strategy I of node U, then it must be that there is no alternative strategy uh, Uj that would give him the better payoff, so you get this condition. And that's essentially what that's essentially the equilibrium condition for the polymetrics game. Except that you need to normalize these guys. And when you try to normalize these guys, you run into the problem that uh, you, you know, the lawyers don't, take, don't, don't play uh, uniform strategies over their clients, but they, but they play approximately uniform distribution of their clients. So this inequality gets messed up a little bit. So effectively, that means that the players are almost best responding. Uh, the marginal distributions are an approximate Nash equilibrium of the polymetrics game. Hence, uh, you know, also because the polymetrics game came from a arithmetic circuit SAT problem, an approximate evaluation of that problem, but thi these are all PPD hard as I pointed out earlier. That's the high level idea. And, um, you know, trust me, the details are not hard at all. Okay, so uh, you just have to trust me that, you know, uh, approximate uniform distributions, the approximate uniform distributions that I claim are true, and that dividing, you know, dividing by, uh, you know, uh, approximately one over n here doesn't mess up this uh, condition too much. So this was, this was the end of the proof, basically. That, that's basically how the proof goes. So if you have, if you have this, it's easy to, to do this, and then it's easy to go here. Now, um, any questions? Now the reduction I showed you was not from the original paper. It was from uh, it was established by a follow-up paper by Chen and Deng. In our original paper, we actually reduced took this problem and reduced it to four-player Nash. Uh, and the only reason, the proof is identical to the one I showed you, the only reason that we went to four players instead of two players is that uh, we had, uh, our, our gadgets were f four partite instead of bipartite. So we had four colors and four lawyers. Now why did we have four bipartite gadgets? Well, we were being a bit silly, okay? So <laughs> uh, we had, uh, in our arithmetic circuit, we had an extra gate, which was multiplication, not by constant, but by multiplication of two numbers. And you can show that this, but, but we didn't use it. <laughs> so <laughs> we're being a bit silly, okay? So <laughs> we had this uh, gadget here that we weren't using, and it was hard to map it down. It was, it, it was actually, it's impossible to make it into a bipartite gadget, okay? So, you know, in our original paper, we made it into a four-partite gadget, and then in a follow-up paper, we actually managed to reduce it to a three-partite gadget. But then this multiplication gadget, actually, you can show, cannot be reduced to bipartite. So these guys observe that, actually, we are not using multiplication. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, you can implement all gadgets that we actually use with bipartite graphs, so you can go down to two, two lawyers instead of three lawyers, <laughs> okay? So, you know, it was, uh, you know, it felt like leaving money on the table, but uh, it's okay. Cool. Uh, okay, that's my discussion of the PPD completeness of Nash. Yeah. Obviously, uh, zero sum games, it's easy to find an equilibrium. Yeah. Um, is there something in between zero sum games and general two player yeah. games for which any hardness result is known? Uh, yeah, so a natural way to uh, interpolate between zero-sum games and um, general two-player games is the following. So in a, in a zero-sum game, so let's call R and C the payoff matrices of the two players. The game is zero-sum if R plus C, the sum of these two matrices, is identically zero, as I, sh as I, uh, 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 I, as I claimed in the, the very first slide I gave last time. Now, uh, you can call a game rank R if R plus C has rank 
R. Okay. Now what is known is that rank one games can be sold in P. Uh, I believe that it's known that rank three games are PPD hard. And you should look at the paper by Ruta, sorry, by Meta, Ruta Meta, in uh, uh, 14, I believe, where she shows that. She might, might even be showing two, rank two, but I'm not sure. Maybe there's some uh, gap there. Maybe, maybe it's even, uh, OK, uh, uh, you know, so there is a constant where it's already PPD hard. Um, right. And, and uh, you know, while I'm here, I mean, if you're interested in uh, interest, I mean, uh, an interesting open question is, uh, approximate equilibria. So interesting open problem. So approximate Nash equilibria. Uh, even in two-player games, we don't know how to find them. So let me uh, uh, remind you what this is. So a Nash equilibrium is a pair of strategies such that no one has an incentive to change his randomization, given uh, what the other player is doing. An epsilon Nash equilibrium is uh, uh, when these conditions are true to within an additive epsilon. Okay, so. No player has incentive to, to more than epsilon, additive epsilon incentive to change his strategies. Now, uh, okay, so at most additive epsilon incentive to change. Now, what do we know about uh, these problems? Well, if, uh, if, uh, you know, if the input to your problem is a game and an epsilon, then it follows from these, those results that that's PPD complete. Okay. Uh, now it's even true that if your input is a game, and you have a predetermined, pre-specified epsilon that's inverse polynomial in the size of the game, so that the, the, the input is a game, and there is a, a, um, a, an inverse polynomial function, and that's your epsilon, and you want to find an inverse polynomial Nash equilibrium of this given game that's still PPD complete. But what is not known is epsilon constant. How hard is it to find equilibria when epsilon is a constant? And uh, if your matrices have entries in uh, <coughs> 0, 1, then we know how to do this in time n to the order log n over epsilon squared. We know that there is no FP task for the problem uh, because uh, of uh, actually these results uh, fo follow up results to these results. What I, what I claimed earlier about inverse polynomial accuracy prohibits an FP task for the problem. Uh, but a P task is possible. What we have is a quasi P task. So if you have a n strategy game and you're interested in some constant epsilon, then we can get you uh, an epsilon Nash equilibrium n to the log n over epsilon squared time. And because I'm looking at additive epsilons, I'm also normalizing my payoffs to be in 0, 1, so that epsilon uh, is related to the maximum payoff of the game. So that's what we have. And it's a you know, great open problem if you can improve this um, or, or, you know, or show a lower bound. Okay? That's a great open problem. Uh, speaking of which, uh, if the rank of this game is up to, I believe, logarithmic, we know how to get a pitas. Okay. Now, I don't have too much time left, so uh, I guess I had two options uh, for today. One was to talk about uh, different problems that you can show PPD hard. 
um, or to talk about other existence arguments. And I think I only have time for one of the two. So, you know, uh, right? So one is to, uh, the other option is to show other arguments of existence in TFNP. So two examples or other arguments. What do you guys vote? So who wants two other examples? Okay, who's keeping the count? <laughs> 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 okay, who wants uh, other existence arguments? <laughs> okay, so I think there's uh, a slight majority for other existence arguments, so I'm going to show that. Okay, so uh, cool. So PPD is founded on the directed parity argument. Other natural arguments of existence uh, in combinatorics are the following, and each of them is going to correspond to a different complexity class. This is a parity argument on an undirected graph. If an undirected graph has a node of odd degree, then it must have another node of odd degree, uh, also, also known as the handshaking lemma, I believe. Uh, well, this is another simple one. If a DAG, uh, you know, any DAG, has a sink that's going to give rise to the class PLS. Uh, and that's the pigeonhole principle. If you have a function mapping n elements to n minus 1 elements, then there is a collision. That's going to give rise to PPP. So PPA stands for polynomial parity on undirected graphs. PLS, uh, polynomial local search. PPP, polynomial pigeonhole principle. And uh, I'm going to define them formally in the next few slides. Okay? So I'm going to start with PPA just because it's very similar to PPAD, except there's no direction. Uh, and um, uh, the input to the problem is uh, a circuit that induces a graph over all n bit strings. So the circuit gets as input a node and it outputs two strings. Okay, it's a one string, outputs two strings. Now, this circuit induces an undirected graph over all possible strings in the following way. There is a edge between string 1 and string 2 if v1 is in the output list of v2 and v2 is in the output list of v1. Okay, so this circuit gets n bits as input and has two n bits as output. And no matter what it is, it doesn't use a graph over strings uh, that uh, places an edge between these two strings if uh, v1 is in the output list of v2 and vice versa. Now, in the same reasoning as last time, in the same spirit as last time, any input C is going to reduce a graph with a particular structure. What's that structure? The out degree of every node is what? At most, 2. Hence, the graph that is induced by any given circuit is going to be a collection of isolated vertices, cycles, and paths. Uh, the odd degree node problem is the following. If the zero string is, has odd degree, then I want you to find me another node with odd degree, which we know exists by the handshaking lemma. Otherwise, if zero to the n has even degree, you know, just say yes and, you know, call it a day. No? <laughs> now, PPA is the class of search problems in um, NP that are reducible, polytime reducible to this problem, to the odd degree node problem, whose graph structure is, you know, like uh, very similar to PPD, except there are no directions. So any circuit C defines a graph of this form except the graph is over exponentially many vertices, so we cannot just go and uh, check every node, uh, every node's degree. So the question is, if 0 to the n is, has odd degree, then there must be another node of odd degree. Any of these nodes is a valid solution to the problem. Uh, something that um, I didn't mention before for PPD, but it's useful to mention, and I'm also going to mention it for PPA. If I insist on finding the other end of this path, of this specific path that starts at zero, the problem is not in FNP. 
okay right so it's crucial that given the unbalancedness or the odd degree of this node I allow you to return any other unbalanced uh, any other odd degree node that's very crucial if I insisted on you returning me the uh, other endpoint of the path that starts at zero that's above NP basically because there's no sort certificate that this node is in the other end of the path starting at zero okay so it's very crucial that I allow you to return any odd degree node okay now an interesting problem that is in this class and as far as we know not in PPAD is the problem Smith which is given a Hamiltonian circuit in a three regular graph find me another Hamiltonian circuit in this graph now this graph is not exponentially big it's actually a graph that you can write down okay so I give you a graph explicitly and I also give you a Hamiltonian circuit in this graph I claim that there is another Hamiltonian circuit okay the question is find it now why is there always a Hamiltonian circuit well that follows from a theorem by Smith uh, saying that uh, with, you know, a theorem by Smith implies that there is always another Hamiltonian path and let me actually show it to you it's very simple so here's actually a copy from Papadimitrius 94 paper uh, uh, I guess there is a missing apostrophe here in any event so here's the input graph okay and obviously uh, I mean uh, obviously this is a Hamiltonian circuit right Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm following the outer boundary here, going inside, and then coming back here. Okay, that's the Hamiltonian circuit. And here is the same circuit, except I've removed one edge, x and y. And here I'm, I'm showing a bunch of operations you can do to this Hamiltonian path circuit. I mean, this is a Hamiltonian path. Um, to create another Hamiltonian path with a, a same edge missing, and adding that edge, you get another Hamiltonian circuit. And the series of operations is very simple. So what you do is the following. So you know, so you start with, you know, it doesn't matter. I can start with an arbitrary node. But uh, all, this, all, this, all the circuits, all, all the circuits I'm going to be defining that uh, um, will have x as one of the two endpoints, but the other endpoint is going to be moving around. And in the end, it's going to get back to the, this vertex. Hence, I can add that edge back and get the circuit. Okay? So I start with the circuit. I remove one edge, x and y. And I'm about to show you that there is another Hamiltonian uh, path that misses the same edge, but is different than this one. So it's going to be that one. Okay? Now let me try to argue that there is another Hamiltonian path that is missing the same edge. How am I going to do that? Well. In the sequence of Hamiltonian uh, paths that I'm going to define, x is going to stay fixed, y is going to be moving around. Now let's land somewhere in the middle here. Okay. So now y is this guy. Y, because the graph is three regular, and y is an endpoint, there is exactly one edge that's used in the Hamiltonian path, and there are two edges that are missing. I'm going to try to add both of them and have a, and get a circuit and get a path a Hamiltonian path okay what would happen if I try to add this edge into this path well that wouldn't be a pa path anymore uh, so because this guy would have degree three if I added that edge now I have to kill one of the two edges adjacent to this node and I'm going to kill the one that maintains the fact that the graph is connected. Right, so if I add this edge and I kill this edge, I'm screwed. The path is not con the graph is not connected anymore. So I'm going to kill that edge. So what happens here? I added that edge and I kill that edge. And this is what I got. If I try to add this edge, then this node will have degree 3. I have to kill either that edge or that edge. I can kill exactly one to avoid disconnecting my graph 
and I'm going to be killing that one, and that's going to bring me here. So every Hamiltonian path uh, has exactly two neighbors corresponding to um, adding uh, one of the two missing uh, uh, edges from the y endpoint of that path. And there's only one way this thing can stop, well, you know, uh, by arriving at y, okay, which will give me, if I don't arrive, if I don't get uh, endpoint y to come back to its original position, like I'll, I'll keep going. Okay. So this, 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 um, in other words, like uh, my proof of Sperner, what I did here is I defined a neighborhood relationship between Hamiltonian paths, which was adding an edge one of the two missing edges from the endpoints. And I know that the only stopping condition is if I get here. And that's why Smith is in PPA. Now it's a very interesting problem to show that this is PPA complete. Okay. Uh, let me define the class PLS. Uh, that was defined earlier by uh, um, Johnson, Paparimitri, Yanakakis. Uh, now I want to implement a class that uh, exploits this argument that every DAG has a sink. The way I'm going to do that is I'm going to give you two functions. Function C is going to take, uh, both of them are ha have n bits as inputs. This guy, C, is, uh, uh, will output a list of strings, of list of k strings. Okay, so it has n bits as input and k n bits as output. While this guy is outputting, uh, you know, some real number. I mean, some rational number, whatever. So, but I interpret the output of this circuit as a number. I interpret the output of this circuit as a list of other strings. Now, I add an edge between, given these two circuits, uh, that induces a DAG, I claim, in the following way. I add an edge from V1 to V2 if V2 is in the adjacency list of V1. And the score of V2 is better than the score of V1. That's and only then, then and only then I add an edge from V1 to V2. And obviously this is a DAG now because uh, I'm increasing my score as I go along, right? So I cannot come back to where I started. So the problem that uh, I want to define is the find sync problem, which is given two circuits as above, find an X that uh, has better score than any of the adjacent vertices. And such a thing has to exist because if I define this graph and find any sync of this graph, this will satisfy this property. The class PLS uh, are all search problems in NP that are polynomial time reducible to this problem, find sync. The picture for this problem is this, exponentially large graph, but there is a DAG that's implicitly defined by these two vertices, by these two circuits, and all of these are solutions. Uh, interesting problem in this class, an interesting problem in this class is the local max cut problem, a relative of the well-known max cut problem, which is NP complete. In the local max cut problem, I'm giving you a weighted graph, and I want a partition that's not globally optimal, but locally optimal, meaning there is no single node I can move from one to the other side of the cut to improve the cut value. Now, if the weights were bounded and integral, this wouldn't be a hard problem. But for arbitrary weights, it's actually PLS complete to find uh, a local maximum cut. Okay. Final problem, and I'm concluding, is uh, final class is the class PPP. That's trying to implement the pigeonhole principle. Here I'm giving you a circuit that has n bits and in n bit inputs and n bit outputs. And uh, the collision problem that I want to define is given such a circuit, either find me an X that maps to the zero string, 
or find me a pair x and y that map to the same string. Now clearly by the pigeonhole principle, if nobody goes to zero, there must be two guys that collide. Okay, so this problem is also total by the pigeonhole principle. So it always has a solution, no matter what this circuit is. And the class PPP is all problems in NP that are reducible to this problem. Uh, finally, the hierarchy of problems are defined is this. P, F and P, so there's total F and P somewhere here, which I don't show. And these are the relationships of these problems. I haven't shown that these arrows are true, that this is a subclass, uh, PP, this is a subclass of these two classes. This is easy, this is a simple exercise. So you can think about it. Uh, this is basically my introduction to PPA, PPD and related classes. Um, the final thing that I wanted to point out is uh, answering a question that was asked after the previous lecture, which was, why did you define these classes and not just a uh, TF and P complete problem? Why did you have to pay special attention to the precise existence argument? that gives rise to the total, like the guarantee that your problems are total. And the reason for that is that actually um, uh, TFNP is not what is called a syntactic class. In other words, if I give you a problem in TFNP, um, um, if I give you a language, if I give you a, 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 um, a Turing machine, you cannot decide whether that is computing a total problem. That no matter what the input to that machine is, there is always an output, okay? So I had to pay attention to the sp sp specialized existence arguments because for specialized existence argument, I know a priori that the, the problem is total. So in particular, no matter what circuit I give you here, I know, I don't even have to check anything. No matter what input you give me, I know there is a solution. No matter what uh, pairs of circuits you give me here, I don't need to do to check anything. There, I know that the answer to this problem, there also, there's always an answer to this problem, and so on and so forth. Right? This, no matter what you give to me as input, it's important to define uh, complexity classes for which you can show hardness results to find complete problems. Um, Otherwise, you would have, you know, sort of like what is called promise classes, which are not amenable to showing uh, completeness results. Okay. And with that brief note, I want to stop. Th thanks a lot.